Health Minister Aaron Motswaledi unveils radical plans to overhaul health care in South Africa. He's proposing that the rich subsidise the poor. Almost a month after Supra Mahoma Pilo vacated the position of Northwest Premier, the ANC has announced that Deboho Job Mokoro will be his successor. This is E! News at 8, live from Johannesburg. I'm Sally Burdett. Good evening. Health Minister Aaron Motswaledi believes universal health care is achievable in South Africa and will heal the inequalities in the system. Today, the minister provided details on the National Health Insurance Plan. It's still some years from becoming law, but the white paper has been gazetted in Parliament already. Now the Health Department is moving ahead with the next phase of the plan. Zekona Chona has more. The National Health Insurance Programme, as defined by the Minister of Health. NHI is defined as a health financing system that pulls funds to provide access to quality health service for all South Africans based on their health needs and irrespective of their socioeconomic status. Mutsualedi says he's fully aware that the country's existing public health care system is in poor condition and has this to say. Fixing the quality of public health care is never going to be an ending event. It is rather an ongoing and continuing process, which has got no end as long as the health care system exists among our people. It's not, not ever going to come to an end. There's no period where we'll stand up and say the public health care system has now been fixed. He says the planned single fund model will help those most in need. The whole essence of NHI is that South African citizen, citizens, all of them, must have access to public and private health care. The rich have got access to both public and private health care at the same time. Only the poor have got access to one. Mutualeri says South Africa's health care system faces two main problems high costs in private medical health care and the ailing public health care system. He says South Africa already has among the most expensive private health care systems in the world, with the latest data showing the country has overtaken the United States, which is notorious for its exorbitant health care costs. The only way to change this, according to the minister, is a universal system that caters for all. As for who will pay for the new system, there's still no clear answer beyond the minister saying that the rich will subsidize the poor, the young will subsidize the old, and the healthy will subsidize the sick. If treasury rules that is funded through contributions from, it, from the population, we don't know what they are going to rule, but it's mandatory, meaning you can't opt out of it. The plan will be accompanied by amendments to laws governing medical aid funds, Mutualedi says medical schemes are making money at the expense of patients and need stricter regulation. He says the system will be phased in and should be ready by 2026. Chona, Johannesburg. I'm joined in studio now by Dr. Isaac Olumide Koka, a health consultant and a founder of a health services startup here in South Africa. Good evening to you, doctor. It's easy to see um, how a pool of money can help the very poor in South Africa. It's absolutely true that there are massive inequalities in our health system. But isn't this just going to be another tax for already highly taxed citizens who are employed, who are members of private medical aids? Um, good evening, Sally. I think it's a bit more complex than that. Mm -hmm. I think um, working people in, a trans in an untransparent way are already paying health taxes indirectly to the government and they pay their taxes in their salaries. Mm -hmm. And then when they elect to pay for medical aid services from medical aids, we need to take a step back and say to ourselves, only 15, 16% of people in South Africa are actually in the private healthcare system. The funds that are in the private healthcare system are almost the same as the funds that are allocated to the other 84% who, who are subscribers to the public health system. Mm -hmm. So the, the NHI is more than about money, in my opinion. I think it's about how we're going to plan 
the delivery of healthcare. Um, I think it's about um, the human resources, the mm. doctors, the nurses, the other care providers. So um, the, the consumers who are worried um, at home that um, are, are paying both um, taxes and medical aids, I think the NHI is probably um, good news for them but in the medium to long term, not so much in the short term. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's going to be an adjustment and perhaps an adjustment in mindset as well. It's interesting though because a universal health care is the way many countries are going. In Britain, um, it's, it's a point of pride, their national health. Do you mm. think that in South Africa we can get there? If we look at our ailing health care system, I know that you have interactions in private and public health care sectors. I believe we can get there. Um, I, th I think the national um, health insurance should be a point of pride to um, the country and to citizens because it's for the public good. Mm. Because, um, like I said before, we all know that um, the population in rural areas, the, the health care delivery is not as good as it is in cities. We have family members and relatives who live in those areas and we have concerns about their health care. So any system that is going to improve health care delivery for the broader is, is a national good. And Absolutely. That, that's what we see in the UK, in Thailand, in a lot of countries that have adopted universal health care. Right, so it's, it's time for us to, to start that journey, we'll continue that journey perhaps and keep talking. Thank you so much. That's uh, Dr. Isaac Olomude Koka. Moving on now, in the Northwest Province's Premier-elect, Professor Tebojo Job Mokoro, will be sworn in tomorrow. 70-year-old Mokoro, a former Director General in the Provincial Government, replaces Supra Mohuma Pilo. Now, Malongelo Boy reports that the ANC believes Mokoro is the man for a very daunting job in the troubled province. In recent months, parts of the Northwest Province were hit by a series of service delivery protests as calls for then Premier Supra Mahuma Belu to resign intensified. In Matibokopen, sections of the village school were touched. About 2,000 pupils were unable to attend classes for three months due to service delivery protests. Despite Mahuma Belu exiting the premiership last month, he remains the provincial ANC chairperson. Enter Professor Deboho Job Mohor, touted as the person to bring stability and unity to a province plagued by corruption, division and poor service delivery. Professor Mohoro is a tried and tested activist and administrator fit enough to deal with the challenges at hand including creating stability within the provincial administration and effecting the much needed delivery of basic services. The party is calling on its alliance partners to support Mohoro when he takes office. The ANC in the province has pledged its support to the premier-elect. For Mohoro to assume the position, he will first have to become a member of the Northwest Provincial Legislature, meaning a space must now be created. Malungi Lupui, Johannesburg. The stalemate in wage talks with ESCOM continues. There's still no deal. Trade union NUMSA says a top-heavy leadership is costing the power utility. Uh, they say the power utility needs to trim its number of executives. Negotiations remain deadlocked this evening. Unions demanding a 9% salary hike. The power utility offering 4.7%. We have become experts since these negotiations. We suddenly are negotiating on behalf of ESCOM um, against workers because workers are soft target. We basically went public to suggest that what ESCOM need to do is basically to retrench workers who are in the lower end. And we refute that. And, and the argument is a false argument that these workers are very expensive and so forth. And I think one of the things we have put on the table is that ESCOM in 2001 it had about 80 top executives. To date, they are around 600, and they are expensive. That's where we said the cut need to take place. One year out from our next general election, important news from the Constitutional Court, a ruling on political party funding, has found that politicians can't build an open society if they owe favours 
to private funders. The court today ruled on a case concerning private funding of political parties. Chief Justice Mohueng Mohueng says undisclosed funding could even enable corruption. Erin Bates has the story. It's known as the People's Parliament. Yet, to date, voters have had little information on who, besides government, is bankrolling political parties. And as the saying goes, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Money is the tool they use to secure special favors or to selfishly manipulate those who are supposed to serve and treat all citizens equally. Unchecked or secret private funding from all, including other nations, could undermine the fulfillment of constitutional obligations by political parties and independent candidates so funded, and by extension, our nation's strategic objectives, sovereignty and ability to secure a rightful place in the family of nations. The Constitutional Court says voters must have access to information on private funders. Parliament must now amend the Promotion of Access to Information Act. Details of private donors must be collected, preserved and publicly shared. With a national election on the horizon, declaring private donors could be a game changer. That is, if disclosure can be enforced in time. In March, the National Assembly passed a bill on disclosing political party funding. It now needs to go through the National Council of Provinces. And then, of course, the big question on how disclosing party donorship will work in practice. All this in the months leading up to the 2019 national election. Aaron Bates, Johannesburg. Still ahead, hundreds of distressed VBS account holders queue to withdraw their cash amid fears that the bank is struggling to stay afloat. Hundreds of VBS account holders have spent the day queuing outside the bank's Toyando branch to try and withdraw funds and then close their accounts. The troubled bank is currently under curatorship. Fourteen municipalities have investments in the bank, leading to concerns that many of them could be plunged into further financial distress. Cooperative Governance Minister William Kize has urged the affected municipalities to work on recovery plans. Many VBS clients say they've lost confidence in the bank, but one of the bank's curators insists the bank won't be going under. People shouldn't um, come and um, very early in the morning trying to go and access their money. They should come through normal hours. Um, half past eight, the bank, the branch is open. They should come through and then they will be assisted. There's no need at all to sleep there or to come there in the middle of the morning. Uh, then we are asking people not to, to do that at all uh, because the bank won't be closed uh, on the 31st of, uh, of August. News from our roads, the N3 in KwaZulu-Natal has been reopened. This after yesterday's disruptive protest. The truck driver's blockade closed one of our busiest national roads for 24 hours. Truckers upset over the employment of foreign nationals parked their vehicles on both sides of the road, linking Durban and Johannesburg. A case of public violence and one of obstructing traffic has been opened. More than 60 drivers have been arrested. Government says it's in ongoing talks with the trucking industry over issues relevant to the sector. Truck drivers want several changes and want to meet with the minister. Some of the companies, you see, they don't give their drivers rest. The drivers driving from Deben to Jobek, no rest, even to give them money for truck stop, they don't give them. Those foreigners are first priority to them because they agree everything, even if it's not good. Do you think this protest has anything to do with xenophobia? Yeah, I, I don't know that really, uh, I don't know. But majority, if you can see those truck drivers, are from people outside, people from here, South Africa. They are not working, are driving taxis, while trucks are driven by people from outside.
Let's recap your top story. Health Minister Erin Motswaledi unveils radical plans to overhaul health care in South Africa. After the break, we've got sports news for you and new Bloemfontein Celtic coach Steve Compella says they need to get back to their glory days. Good evening, everyone. There's a very settled pattern all across the country at the moment. Although a weak front has been brushing over the southern parts, the rain out of the system dissipates overnight, and by tomorrow afternoon, things will have cleared over the southwestern corner of the country. It will be a mostly sunny day over South Africa, cool weather in the south, while in the northeast, it's going to be a warmer afternoon. And by evening, a bit of cloud starts to push in over parts of KwaZulu-Natal and Mpumalanga, but we don't expect any rainfall from that. The Northern Cape will be sunny on Friday afternoon, quite warm for some parts, including Uppington and Kimberley, which will climb into the mid-20s. In the Western Cape, we see clearance taking place as the day goes on, and temperatures should get to about the 20-degree mark for most areas. The Eastern Cape stays sunny as well, a little bit of cloud possible for Port Elizabeth at first. No rain over this area, but it is going to be a very chilly morning over the mountainous parts where temperatures will be dropping below freezing overnight. A warm day for Ulundi as well as Newcastle and Richards Bay. Breezy at first along the KZN coastline, but those winds become lighter in the afternoon. In Mpumalanga, we see a hot day for the low felt. Skukuza climbs to 31, but it will be cold at first with a minimum temperature of 7. And if you're looking for warm weather, Limpopo is the place to be as temperatures climb above 25 degrees for much of the area. And in the northwest, typically cold for this province at first with Freiburg dropping below freezing down to minus 2 degrees. It will also be a frosty morning for Bethlehem as well as Zastron in the Free State. Not too bad in the afternoon with a high of 20 degrees. And finally for Gauteng, temperatures staying slightly above normal for this time of the year. Once again for Johannesburg reaching a high of 22. Looking ahead to your weekend weather conditions, and Saturday brings with it mostly dry conditions to South Africa, although a weak front could bring some rain to Cape Town. But by Sunday, it's going to be rain-free all across the country, and another fantastic afternoon lies ahead for the Free State and Gauteng. And finally, do you have 600 million rand lying around? No, me neither. Well, the 1962 Ferrari 250 GTO racing car could be on next ride. Going on auction in August, it's likely the most expensive car to ever be offered for sale. Auctioneer Sotheby's says the red Ferrari is part of a limited edition of 36 cars. It's got a prestigious history. It won the 1962 Italian National GT Championship and nine other races with its first owner driver. Let's recap your top stories. Health Minister Aaron Motswaledi unveils radical plans to overhaul health care in South Africa. He's proposing the rich subsidise the poor. And that's your news. Take care. Good night.